everyone and welcome back to my channel Beth Chats Books. Now today's video is going to be my June wrap up. Now before I start I just thought I'd give a little shout out to Kieran from Key Reads and Anthony Andrews from Anthony Andrews's booktube channel because I watched their live Instagram story yesterday where they were catching up and talking about books and I didn't get to see it live so I watched it in the evening but I just wanted to say well done boys because it was both their first time doing an Instagram live and as I mentioned to you guys previously I'm planning on doing a live video with Anthony later on in July this month to talk about A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lingle and it was so exciting to see them do it because I'm a little bit nervous about our Instagram live me and Anthony's because I've never done that before and I just thought they did a brilliant job and I thought it was really important as well. They mentioned Ali May's readathon and my channel about how I had talked about in a previous video about this readathon. So I was really happy that they mentioned that because that's encouraged them to go and join Ali May's Twitter group and participate in the readathon, which is later on in this month. So I'm really, really excited. So again, I'll link Ali May's Twitter down below and I'll link both Key Reads and Anthony Andrews' channel down below, but I'm pretty sure that if you're watching my videos, you've probably seen both of these channels before. But I just was real excited. It was spreading the news for this great readathon, and it gave me a chance to see what an Instagram Live would look like. So well done, boys. So without further ado, I'm just going to go on to my wrap up now. So I'm really pleased with myself. I read about nine books this month, which was really exciting. The last couple of books I've read in the last couple of days because it's been nice weather. And I've had a few days here and there where I've been working, but a few days when I've been off. So I've literally read a book in the sunshine in a day. So the last two I read in one sitting. So that was really exciting and it just bumped up my reading count. So I'm very pleased. So the first book I want to talk about is Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban by J.K. Rowling. Now this was the first book I read this month. And I believe I think I gave it four stars. I think at the moment I'm giving them all four stars because I enjoy the reading experience equally. This used to be one of my favourite Harry Potter books because I was in love with Lupin as a character. I really connected with him. I loved him in the films. I just have a real soft spot for him because he's the first teacher kind of male figure, apart from Dumbledore, but to me that's always a bit questionable, that becomes a kind of father figure to Harry in my opinion. He reaches out and he helps him in a really difficult position and I understand that his relationship with serious becomes very intense and deep later on in the, in the next kind of book or so but the way that the films portray it is that Sirius is here and then he's gone but Lupin seems to be a figure all the way until the last book where he is trying his best to help Harry and I just love him for that. Also I love the hippogriff, I love the magical creatures, I love that they start to do more interesting subjects in this book and things heat up a little bit. I like the time turner bit where she keeps going back in time. It's just a classic and I'm really excited to carry on with the Harry Potter series. So you know I don't have to say much more, I really enjoyed this and I'm going to start reading The Goblet of Fire next month. So there's that one. And then the next book that I read in the month of June is Tinman by Sarah Winman and this is a beautiful story actually. It's entirely not what I expected. I believe I gave this four stars, maybe four and a half, I can't really remember. I always film these videos and don't prepare and don't look at my Goodreads so you know I just kind of wing it but you know I give you what I feel as I'm reviewing them so that's good enough isn't it? And basically this follows two main characters Ellis and Michael and Ellis falls in love with a character called Annie when she walks into their lives but previously Ellis and Michael have a relationship and it evolves into a kind of romantic sexual relationship at a pivotal time in their relationship and their development where they're trying to understand their own identity then Annie comes and Ellis is besotted with Annie and they end up marrying and they become this kind of weird three-way relationship where Annie has a lot of deep feelings for Michael but not necessarily romantic but a conglomerated relationship it's always a three-way which is very intimate and interesting and obviously some things happen I don't want to spoil it and I always start going into spoilery mode without thinking but uh, some things happen and and then it kind of looks back on their relationship Michael has a very close relationship to Ellis's mum Ellis's mum <laughs> Ellis's mum 
and she ends up getting very poorly and she dies but we 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 know that early on in the book so it's not kind of a spoiler ish and so the, both characters we have a bit where they reflect on that relationship to the mother and then their kind of relationship to Annie is really interesting I really enjoyed it because it's about characters it's not really about a plot obviously there's some devices there's some surprises in here I guess some developments but it's about this three-way relationship and I found it so interesting because it's it is the epitome of fluidity it's not about their relationship in terms of their sexuality or their romantic preference the fact that these three people kind of merge together into one relationship and one unity and how when that's disrupted it affects the characters equally is really interesting to me because these characters aren't boxed off into their sexuality or the fact that Ellis and Annie are married. It's an exploration of their relationship and the complexity of it that defeats those boundaries and those identifications. So I really loved it and it's a very short book so it's very very quick to read. I think I enjoyed it more upon reflection than when I was reading it because it is not what I expected at all and because it was so highly acclaimed at points I was thinking oh is, is this it but you appreciate the talent and the simplicity but yet the depth of this book after you finished it. So I would recommend this to anyone and everyone. So there we are. And then the next book I'm pretty sure I started reading but I didn't finish till the end of the month and that's The Immortalist by Chloe Benjamin. So this follows four siblings who live in America, they're Jewish siblings and they live in New York and they are told that there's this strange fortune teller, the strange lady who lives a couple of streets down from them, who can tell you the day you're going to die. So they all go and they find out the day they're going to die. They all learn the day they're going to die separately to one another, they have to go in on their own and see her but obviously we get to find out the days that they die and we go through the trajectory of each of the individual siblings lives so we start with Simon, Clara, Daniel and Varia and I think I gave it four stars or four and a half as well I really enjoyed that every individual story was definitely different and unique I was worried because I was listening to an audiobook and it's 11 hours and 29 minutes on audiobook so I was worried that it was going to get repetitive or boring because how do you make their lives so drastically different but they were very unique and I was interested up till the end of all the different characters my favourite stories were Clara's and Simon's because both of those characters were very bohemian. Simon was a gay man who ends up moving to San Francisco and he drops out of school early and he goes and chases his identity and his story is kind of indulgent and, and it's all about sexual identity and discovery. And then Clara's is about this bohemian life. She doesn't want to go to university, she doesn't want to settle down and she wants to be a magician and it's kind of the trajectory of where she takes her life and then Daniel and Arias are a little bit more straightforward in a way so Daniel's kind of always acted as the the eldest even though he's not and he's quite straight laced he's a doctor and then he goes through some identity crises 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 oh god I'm not very good with saying these things today Ugh. And Varia's, she's a scientist, everything's very methodical, she ends up having OCD and, and her life has to be very structured, but obviously as, as her story progresses we find out that it's not very structured, it's a bit of a hot mess like everybody's. So I loved that, I loved Gertie who is their mother, she kind of is here and there in all the stories, I think she's a very interesting character and I really like the other minor characters, so you start to find out people's sons and daughters and boyfriends and there's one character Eddie who was besotted with Clara and he ends up showcasing in Daniel so we learn a lot more about Clara in Daniel's eyes through the character of Eddie. <laughs> I think it was really well done and I really enjoyed it. It didn't really blow my socks off. I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the characters and I invested in the characters so obviously it was an enjoyable read for me. That kind of sounds interesting to you which I ended up reading it because I heard that Jasmine over at Jasmine Reads had read it and the way she described it just made it sound very interesting to me and it didn't disappoint it, it does what it says on the tin really so I recommend you check it out if it sounds interesting to you and then the next book that I read was The Vegetarian by Han Kang now this is translated from the Korean by Deborah Smith and this is a very short book and this is a very very strange book 
but I absolutely adored it so I gave this book five stars. Now I mentioned in my Goodreads kind of review because I have this weird thing where I have to write some kind of written review about all my books at the moment because I write it in a notebook but I also like writing it on Goodreads so it's there so you guys can get a little bit of a taste about what I thought and I would mentioned in that Goodreads review that this is one of those books that is a perfect example of when something deeply disturbs you but you, you love it. So I think now people who watch my channel and have seen some of the five star books I've given over the last year will realise that sometimes a little bit of a darker, deeper, disturbing book, if I really connect with it, I end up giving five stars and it makes it kind of look like I enjoy depressing books but this book was so fantastically constructed the character was very kooky and strange it, it perfectly encapsulates this fascination with who is this woman we can't pin her down we can't connect with her which i thought would make me cold to a book like this because she's very hard to read and to open the layers of and to understand but to me it just it connected with that part of me that's so interested in the psyche of people and why people do things and how people act these ways it really connected with that part of me that's fascinated by human nature and the fact that this character is so unpredictable and based on the kind of culture of where they're living in Korea the rest of the family cannot cope with her mental condition and the deterioration of her mental abilities and this very simplistic decision for the main character to be vegetarian because she's got these dreams that repulse her that are centred around eating meat and the reaction from the family is fascinating to me because it's a very cultural reaction that in the place that she's living it's just unheard of to be vegetarian and it's just not right and the characters cannot comprehend this and and how it escalates and then there's the second part of the story it takes on a very sexual theme without a sexual kind of trigger sometimes in books there's there's a sexual trigger there's sexual tension or there is a revealing of feelings that leads to a sexual development and this isn't the case it's just an obsessive image it's very hard to be really non-spoilery with this book but every bit was a different, it, it's kind of cut into three parts and every part was reflective on a different thing and a different relationship to this lady, the main protagonist I guess you could call her, even though we never hear anything from her point of view it's people projecting what they feel about her onto her which was also fascinating for me. And this translation is beautiful, the language is still beautiful, Deborah Smith has a real talent for encapsulating the culture of the place of Korea and how for a more westernised audience you can feel that cultural vibe underneath the layers of the book but it does not take on the life of the book. I, ju I just really struggling because I was so impressed with it. Just stunning. It's shocking, it's horrific, there's some really really visceral and graphic scenes in here that, that made me when reading it go oh and, and you know feel a little bit disturbed and a bit nauseous but it's just so clever it's just so interesting it's one of these books that you'll still be trying to wrap your head around and considering it's under 200 pages to me that is a talent and a half I know that she's got another book centered on the color white I've forgotten what it's called the white lady or something like that and that I, I know that Shazza over at Hooked on Books had really enjoyed that. I think that's on the current Man Booker list this year, so I'll be sure to check that out. But this is amazing. Rave, rave, rave reviews from me. There we are. Now the next book that I read was technically a play, and that's Hamlet by William Shakespeare. So I read this, obviously, because I went to go and see it in the Globe, and I read it on the coach on the way down in the morning before we went. So one thing I will say about Hamlet is it's very digestible and easy to read. I would say certain audiences will struggle. If you're under a certain reading age, then it, it might not be accessible. But, you know, for a reader who reads a lot of fiction, it's quite easy to digest. It's got all the action. There's, you know, revenge. There's ghosts. There's a big battle at the end. There's accidental death. There's suicide. It's got a lot of juicy adult content that, you know... I can understand why it's been so favourable and been highly, highly beloved by many people because it has got all the core manly action.
action-packed things. You know, this is your first ever kind of action play, you know, now you watch these big Avengers and things like this, you can see why this was so popular because men and women alike have always had a bit of a thirst for some action and some revenge and some kind of gory plot line. So that satisfies that part. Um, I think I gave this four stars because I haven't read a lot of Shakespeare. I've read The Tempest, I've read Romeo and Juliet. And so this is a really good one that I would recommend to people who first want to get into Shakespeare and trying to find a way in because this is quite simplistic. It's not intense. There's not a huge array of comedic jokes or things that you either won't be able to get or are placed in it in general because it's a tragedy it's not a comedy it's more serious so it's easier to understand you know that when people are upset or there's a lot of tension like i mentioned when i last mentioned this book when i was talking in my brew time babble i am fascinated by the relationship between ophelia and hamlet and it's not explored very explicitly in this play but there is so much meat on the bones for that so many contextual things that i kind of wanted to dissect about how Ophelia feels, how Hamlet really feels and then when Ophelia dies how that's brought about by the complexity of the relationship between the two of them and this unrequited love element. I really enjoyed that but that's not the main bit of the play so don't worry if you're not in a fan of romance but I, I really found that the most interesting bit of the whole play. But it's a great place to start, it's very easy to follow and I would recommend, and I'd also recommend watching it at the Globe because it was bloody brilliant. So there's that. And then the next book is Lullaby by Lila Slim Slimani. I'm terrible. I'm terrible, terrible. But I also loved this book, so I gave this book five stars. Now, this had got so much acclaim, and I love the podcast, What Page You On, that has Bethany Rutter and Alice Slater. And they always discuss thrillers and things like that. And they had mentioned that they thought this particular book was overrated. And when I went to go visit my auntie in Milton Keynes, she went into Waterstones and there was a buy one, get one half price. So I was the half price book. So she said, just pick something. And I was really intrigued by this because some people have loved it. Some people have been a bit meh about it. And I really want to see what I would think. A lot of people had then said it's got so much hype and it's undeserved. But I had the exact opposite experience. I read this book and was really happy that it's got the rave that it has because it's kind of a thriller but I was trying to explain to my sister who's not really into the whole crime thrillery thing that the new hot topic and hot buzzword for thriller is not a who done it but a why done it and this is a why done it we know from the beginning that the nanny has ended up killing the children and we want to know why and I really love psychological thrillery books. Now I don't tend to read them as much because I find that some people aren't very good at writing them. Some of them are too, very predictable and I want to get into the meat and bones of a character as well and really dissect them and this really satisfied that part of me because we already know what happened so we're not trying to second guess the plot here. We're trying to understand the complexity of this character and she has many layers that I really liked. This book explores purely her character and the development and her mental deterioration and why this happens and for some people that's not their cup of tea, they just want to know who killed someone and why. And that I can understand that for people who don't enjoy that, that's probably why they found this a very meh book because it purely does not go into the, the horror of the crime scene and going backwards and figuring out what happened and then trying to find suspects. It's none of that. This is, we already know from the beginning, but why did she do this? Why she ended up the way she is? Her, we discover her relationship with her husband, her very tumultuous relationship with her own child. And... I find that fascinating. I loved that, that she's very, a character that's hard to pin down and a bit like the vegetarian, that's what kind of sets fireworks off in my head and I'm very interested by that and I think it was done very well. I know it's, this is also a translated work from the French, I believe. It says here, translated by Sam Taylor and it was very short so I didn't think it got too tedious, I don't think we spent too much time with her and there were so many things that I was emotionally connecting with like for example 
when she went on the holiday with the family and she finally broke down a bit of a barrier with the parents and then all of a sudden that was retracted and you don't necessarily sympathise with but this book allows you to understand to some extent and that's what really interests me understanding why people do the things that they do and trying to find some kind of understanding of that which I know some people find very controversial but this book satisfied that for me so it was a five stars and I loved it two more three more books I'm lying to you oh gosh right I'll be as fast as I can so The Bear and the Nightingale is the next one I read by Catherine Ardent. Now I buddy read this with Brianna from Rainy Days and Stormy Nights. I always end up wanting to say something completely different for that channel. And we both ended up finishing it with a bit of a meh response. So this is set in Russia um, a long, long time ago. So this is based around Moscow and then the wilderness. I'm not going to give you a date because I know I'm a history student but I look like an idiot because I have no idea the precise time because it doesn't really reference the time and it references about the landscape of Russia but my Russian history is very vague so I'm not going to embarrass myself so we're just going to say it's a long long time ago and this is based in a time period where the kind of woodland and the northern part of Russia still believed in fairy tales and then the main Moscow area of Russia was interested in Christianity and so they always thought that the kind of other side of Russia was very backwards and very remote and more stupid less educated so it starts in the kind of woodland area and there is a man who has many children he has three sons and a daughter I believe when it starts and his wife is very emaciated she's struggling through the winter and she gets pregnant and he says you know we need to get rid of the child because you need to live they need a mother my children she says no this one's special she's like my mother she's got special powers and no it's gonna be a girl she needs to live and so she ends up dying in childbirth and they have a kind of nanny almost like a, a non biological granny but you know she ends up being like a granny figure to them and that's where the story starts. Then the dad decides, oh, this young daughter of mine, she's, she is absolutely wild. She needs some calming down. My oldest daughter needs to get married and I need a wife that can kind of subdue this, this crazy daughter of mine. But he ends up making some connections with royalty in Moscow, gets a wife who's the, the king of Moscow or the prince or whatever. His daughter who's a little bit tapped who everyone thinks she's a bit mentally unstable because she keeps seeing demons she comes to live with them and the eldest daughter moves out and then one of the sons goes to a convent and the other one moves out and has some kids it's not really that relevant to the plot but anyway then this has got a lot of magical realism in it and the youngest daughter has power she can see these demony things but they quite like her and we were disappointed by the magical realism i thought a lot of it was just thrown in there it becomes at the end a lot of magical realism so there's this kind of wind figure that's death there's this real bear with one eye that's a demon spirit who's brothers with this wind thing there are nymphs water sprites there's the walking dead just the dead keep coming out when they've died and just attacking people and biting them and just a lot of crazy stuff goes on now if you're a fan of high fantasy and magical realism that might sound amazing to you it's kind of almost like the fairy tales that they talk about in this the wooded remote areas of russia almost come to life and they're, they're real and they're no longer stories. This is book one of three. Me and Brianna don't think we're going to continue on with it. When I was reading it, it was easy to read. Didn't know, need to know anything about Russian fairy tales or Russian landscape. But I just felt it was a little bit flat for me and I didn't enjoy the characters very much so I didn't really care who died and who lived which obviously you kind of need to be connected to the characters and be bothered when they die. So I just gave it a a middle of the road three stars I didn't hate it I think the writing was good I think the world building was pretty good but I just think too much was going on and I wasn't invested enough in the characters to see where this story goes so it's a bit of a disappointment for me unfortunately so there's that one and then the next book I read was When Breath Becomes Air by Paul 
Can Calathini. Sorry. This was beautiful. So this is a memoir that was written by Paul. So he was a neurosurgeon. He studied at Stanford and he was just about to finish his residency, which means he would become a senior. And he was diagnosed with lung cancer and it was terminal. And so he starts to write this memoir and half of it is about his experiences as a doctor and half is about his experience as a patient. And then the epilogue is written by his wife Lucy and obviously the book's dedicated to their child because while he is terminal they took some sperm from him and they started a round of IVF and they made the decision to have a child while they knew he was terminal. So before he dies he spends a very limited amount of time with his child. So this is very heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. What I loved about this memoir it's not an indulgence in self-pity, it's not depressing, it's, it's very hard to express because it's very sad what you know and you connect with him and you feel heartbroken but he is not despondent about his situation. He uses it as an exploration of life and death and that borderline and he said that he went into the profession he did because he was fascinated by that but he's also been fascinated by literature and what makes people human and and what is this line between life and death and so he used his condition to explore that even further through his own experience of his own mortality there's something so brave and so open about this that's just so humbling what lucy mentions in the epilogue is how he was so open about his feelings he connected when he was sad but he didn't let it overwhelm him and drown him he decided to live his life in the most authentic way he knew how which was to keep living until he died which I think was amazing and there's a really beautiful tagline in the epilogue where Lucy said what happened to Paul is tragic but Paul was not a tragedy I thought that was really nice because what it's encapsulating is the whole vibe of the book and the, the feel of the story which is that he knows that something heartbreaking is happening and he has to leave this world but he's not sad about it he in his own way comes to terms with it throughout this memoir and it's just beautiful it is very very sad but it's just stunning in the end it's quite a short book because he never really finished it she kind of just finishes it off for him at the end Lucy he talks about his relationship in here in a very honest way and I loved in the epilogue that Lucy said I'm really glad that he was honest about our relationship issues before he was diagnosed with cancer because it's just authentic experience for him and it's just beautiful to connect with this. So he died in 2015, this was shortlisted for a prize in 2017 so that's why it's kind of come back on the radar. It's a fascinating look at what it's like to be a neurosurgeon the very difficult and demanding schedule and then what it's like to go through uh, cancer treatment and how how he got through it was just heartwarming and so brave and to share this experience with us so that it's always here for us even after he's gone is just a beautiful gift to give the world so I think I gave this four and a half stars I think it was just stunning I just loved it so there's that one and then the last book I read this month was a curious incident of the dog in the night time by mark haddon so i believe i gave this four stars so this is a really interesting book this is about christopher who's 15 years old and has autism i think he has aut yeah asperger's he discovers that his neighbor's dog is dead and he goes on a mission to try and find out who killed the dog and we learn throughout this book at the beginning he believes his mother has died but his dad told a bit of a white lie and she moved away with the neighbour's husband, a scandal. And this book is fascinating because it's from the point of view of Christopher. So in some of the book there's pictures and there's a lot of maths questions and he talks about whether he has a good day or a bad day. There's diagrams. I'll see if I can show you stuff. He does like really intricate pictures because he is obsessed with maths and physics and that's how things make sense in the world to him so when he's overwhelmed he has to do complex maths questions what's really interesting if you can see here is that the chapters aren't going in order they go in prime numbers because prime numbers make him comfortable and we, we learn about his emotions and how he sees the world and we look at it through his eyes which I think is so fascinating I think it's so important to see a book like this where we 
get to understand more about how people with Asperger's and autism live their lives. It does have some adult content, obviously it deals with, there's a dog death at the beginning um, which is quite brutal, it's been killed with a big garden fork so that's you know not for kids and it's more for adults to see what it's like to be a child. There's a bit where he tries to circumnavigate the tubes and and get himself to London and how noises overwhelm him when people touch him he hits them because he just doesn't like being touched and I think it's so interesting and so important I think this book was written in 2004 or 5 I believe yeah 2004 well it was that was published in 2004 and I think this was a pivotal time when people were starting to understand what autism means and and how they communicate in different ways and how important it is to communicate with them on their level. So for example in this book when he wants affection he he stretches all his fingers out and his mum stretches her fingers out and they touch and that's like a hug because he doesn't like being touched and he likes his routine. It's just a really interesting look at autism. It's written as a child, almost like a child. I know he's 15 but it, it, it is written almost like a child is writing it. Not the most gripping to read but it's fascinating and I think anybody who's interested in autism or who wants to know more about what it's like you should really read this because it does have an interesting plot as well and it really gives you the insight into the mind of someone with autism and I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed it. So, sorry that was really really long but thank you guys so much for watching this and sticking with me through the end um, I am still going to do that reflective video but I've just been finding it really difficult with the sun out to be motivated to go through all my old videos and write lists I've kind of just been as you can tell sitting in the sun and reading a book all day which I'm not really feeling that guilty about because this sun's not going to be here forever so I might as well utilise it but thank you guys so much for watching. I'll be back very soon with a brand new video, probably my July TBR. And I'll speak to you guys then.